very happy to have Antonio Rafael with us. He's the Detroit-based activist and educator uh, and an education coordinator for the National Wildlife Federation. He has a very interesting uh, bio. Uh, he's a writer, public speaker, entrepreneur, educator, artist, beekeeper, and farmer from Southwest Detroit. He graduated from Eastern Michigan, Michigan University with a double major in political science and economics at a time when the state of Michigan took over the city of Detroit through emergency management. And a great deal of his work has been directed to lecturing, writing, and uh, acting in opposition to the neoliberal assault on his city and attacks on water. His viral street art has been featured in movies, in articles, research papers, he co-founded the RAISE, that's R-A-I-Z, Raise Up Art Collective in 2012. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a collective using art as a way to create consciousness and support uh, move, the movement RAISE Up. Uh, more than just resisting the abuse of public goods, land, water, and people, Antonio is working to transform his community through organizing artistic endeavors and ecological community development through his farm, SW Grows, uh, and the SW Detroit, a new cooperative for honey beekeeping business. So I'm sure you're gonna enjoy, very excited to have him. Antonio, I think it is all yours. Thanks so much. Excellent. Well, welcome. Let me share my screen. Um, PowerPoint. All right, can you guys see the PowerPoint? We can. Excellent. Yeah. So, well, we at Tanong is an Anishinaabe name for Detroit. And I live in the Great Lakes, uh, but I'm actually going to tell this more of my story, a uh, story of self sort of uh, take on things. Um, so, yeah, I work at the National Wildlife Federation, as you mentioned, a lot of things about me. I work at Southwest Grows is my farm, backgrounds in economics, a lot of activism, art. Um, kind of a decolonial lens to a lot of the things I'm gonna be talking about today. But I also do a good amount of uh, beekeeping and writing and a wide variety of projects. So I was born and raised in Southwest Detroit. It's a Latino neighborhood in Detroit. Uh, and it's a really super, Detroit, if you're not familiar with the city, uh, it's a super like racially segregated area. So the green here is uh, African-American, the blue is European-American. Uh, red is like Southeast Asian, uh, orange is Latino. And I live in this Latino neighborhood right here. Um, and if you look at like the map of Detroit, it's like almost a one for one. You could really outline the green um, and that's Detroit. But it's not only racially segregated, it's heavily class segregated. Uh, so this shows uh, areas by income. And same thing, like if you look at Detroit, it's very much almost like a one for one of the red area. So the average income of the entire city of Detroit is $26,000 a year. It's a very low income city. Uh, and it's surrounded by a lot of wealth uh, just outside the city. So this is the Metro Detroit area, 5 million people. The city of Detroit is the red area, low income area uh, inside uh, of all that suburban area. So I think that I grew up kind of like with a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance uh, traveling between Detroit and the places where I was uh, having community and family life, going to school, um, were places uh, further and further away from Detroit uh, as the neoliberal assault on education kind of took place. Uh, schools were closing and I was moving further and further away from my home community and further and further into these like purple green areas into the suburbs. Uh, and I I say cognitive dissonance, it's like, why is it that there's a, such a big difference between these two areas, the red and the purple and the green? Um, that really came to a head in 2009 when I was in college. Uh, a year after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, I was actually studying for finals when my mom gave me a call. I, was, I, wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a pharmacist. I was studying clinical lab studies, um, but my mom gave me a call she said, come home quick, the house is on fire. So me and my brother got in some cars and drove home fast. Um, and uh, by the time we got home, our house was smoldering. And um, there were guys who were taking the stuff from inside of our house and throwing it into a dumpster. 
Um, and I had to dig for this, dig through this dumpster uh, for family albums, for, for all those like treasured possessions that families acquire over the years. Like me and my brother had to dig out of a dumpster. Um, so it turned out the day that my parents' house was getting repossessed uh, was the same day uh, that it caught on fire, just incidentally. Um, and I was not alone in this. In a city of 700,000 people, about 180,000 people in Detroit have lost their homes since the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and there are a lot of cities who are in a terrible position financially and economically as a result of the 2008 financial crisis and the predatory lending that had ensued. Um, and Detroit was in a really tough economic way. And this incident really motivated me uh, to want to study economics and, and switch up my major and, and switch up kind of my life trajectory. Um, Detroit's water system was also did part of like something that would become the bankruptcy process that Detroit was going through. Uh, and there's a lot of really terrible negotiations and uh, mortgage swap or financial mechanisms that took away Detroit's water system. Um, the 2008 financial crisis had a huge negative impact on uh, African American wealth, uh, and Detroit is the blackest major city in the United in the United States. Um, so that really, really taking down people's income and then taking down the value of their homes really negatively impacted the city of Detroit. Um, yeah, and I was in college at the time. Um, you know, I went on to graduate from college in 2012, and. Uh, I was you know, active in a, some of the big things that really impacted me was uh, traveling to Latin America and understanding the relationship of the United States to Latin America, uh, understanding the roots of neoliberalism and free market sort of uh, fundamentalist policies. Um, and this is a mural we painted with the Zapatista communities in Southern Mexico. Zapatistas are uh, an indigenous uh, revolutionary movement that took control of, uh, of a city in Chiapas, which is the southern state of Mexico. Uh, and they've been fighting against the government. And they did this in like during the time of NAFTA. So I had a chance to go down there and meet these people and just really learn about the United States from an outside perspective and learn about the history of Latin America. And that really kind of woke me up to a lot of things uh, that I couldn't conceptualize and understand as a young person. But I was born into the Reagan era. You know, I was born in 1988, the end of Ronald Reagan's time in office in which like a political philosophy coming from Milton Friedman had kind of in the actually, University of Chicago, not you guys, but University of Chicago, uh, free market economic policies had really taken hold and shaped my life in ways that I didn't understand. Everything from like my education, you know, my parents took out a mortgage and a huge loan they couldn't afford to pay for our private school education. That's because of the sort of free market policies and the charter schools uh, that were being created during this neoliberal era. At the same time, the United States has been pushing this in Latin America a long time before it came home to roost. And this is generally true of a lot of things, like what happens to marginal communities on the periphery will always come home and be impacted on the people who are at the core of that society. Um, whether that be like IMF policies to um, uh, surveillance and a lot of other policies. Uh, so the sort of things that were happening to Detroit uh, the economic crisis that it was facing was very much so similar to the way the IMF and the World Bank imposed economic um, structural adjustment agreements on Latin American countries and countries all over the world. Uh, so the time I graduated in 2012, Detroit was getting put into this vicious bankruptcy process in which the government of Detroit was handed over to a private company uh, called Jones Day. And that company proceeded to give away a ton of the assets of the city and sell off public goods and public, public features of the city and giving away a lot of property to the local billionaires, some of whom actually caused the financial crisis in Detroit. In fact, the loan that my parents received uh, came from a billionaire who ended up buying up most of downtown. So he was a predatory lender. Two thirds of the loans that he gave away uh, resulted in people losing their homes in the city of Detroit. And on the back end of the crisis, uh, he was able to buy up a huge percentage of the city. He was a very powerful player named Dan Gilbert. Um, so I uh, started organizing with a community of folks uh, called the Rise Up in 2012. 
we started doing all sorts of popular education. Um, we also started like protesting with civil disobedience, shutting down freeways. Um, this is like the four directions, colors, using graffiti lettering. Uh, and we put this banner out as we like uh, got onto the freeways and shut down traffic so that people um, who are coming into the city would be impacted by, um, and they would know about the bankruptcy process that was happening to Detroiters. Um, I also continued to do graffiti. Uh, I found it to be that a lot of the mainstream media, the news were not covering the work we were doing, the opposition we were organizing. Uh, so for me, taking to the walls and putting my own advertisements and my own thoughts and thinking was something that was a really powerful thing for me to do at the time. Um, I also really came to see uh, the um, things that Detroit was experiencing as a deeply colonial sort of experience. Um, and I think there's this interesting interplay between race and colonialism that I think is useful for thinking about. Uh, red lands plus black labor equals white gold. Um, and that's indigenous lands plus the, the, the uh, labor and lives of African people uh, has resulted in a lot of wealth for uh, European Americans. And if we had the time, I'd go through US history and the ecological history of Michigan and show you all of the times in which the government has handed wealth away, taken wealth and land and resources away from indigenous people uh, and black people and given it away to uh, European Americans, whether that be the growth of the suburbs in the 1970s or the new deal in which black and brown people weren't included in that or uh, the clear cutting of Michigan forests, which was a huge like taking away native land and giving it to uh, lumber barons. Uh, there's so many examples in, in US history of uh, these sorts of things. Um, I came, I got really well known for painting this graffiti here. I painted this whole building here on the right. It's the Douglas Brewster projects. They're, the building has since come down. Um, and also this is a, we stuck an ax in the, the head of Columbus. Um, and while we weren't able to stop uh, a lot of the things that were happening in the city, the, how, all the housing foreclosures, and they started shutting people's water off, we weren't able to stop all that, but we were able to stop to change the culture. And we had this statue removed in Detroit, uh, and that was an organizing by a lot of indigenous folks. Um, here's some more graffiti that I was tagging at the time. Uh, it's around 2012 to 2014-15. Um, yeah, I was just kind of in a rage at that point in time. And uh, I took that out on a lot of walls throughout the city. Um, just kind of writing like radical messaging and ideas. Um, and this is some photos of the Rise Up. Uh, and that was a hip hop, and an indigenous hip hop and art in Chicano uh, art collective. And we organized a lot of events and popular education work around water shutoffs, around privatization of education, around housing foreclosures. Uh, just so we could help the community understand a lot of the things that we were seeing and perceiving uh, and make some of these like deeper connections. Um, we also continue to do a lot of like civil disobedience and action. Um, part of this bankruptcy process was uh, shutting off people's water, disconnecting them from the water line when they couldn't afford to pay. Um, the water bills in Detroit were getting upwards of $2,000 and you know, that's like 10% of some people's income in the city, which is a, a big, big chunk. Um, so I painted, me and my buddy Luca painted free the water on this water tower uh, as a way to protest the water shutoffs and simultaneously um, Flint, Michigan, which is a neighboring city, was going through a huge lead water crisis because they had been disconnected from the Detroit water system. Um, so yeah, I was, you know, just really heavily into organizing and activism at this point in my life. And uh, honestly, like when, when we were arrested for uh, painting this water tower, they threatened us with um, two years in jail, a $70,000 fine and like 13 or 14 felonies. Um, and this group of people came together and helped organize with us and raise money. Uh, we got a good lawyer, we beat the case. Um, but it was really took a lot out of me. Uh, and I kind of realized that activism is a exhausting enterprise and wasn't exactly the best way to bring about change uh, in the world. Not saying that people shouldn't do it and I have continued to be engaged in activism and organizing and protesting. But uh, for me, I, I thought I could find a better way to engage people and a better way to, to build with community.
Um, so I went to organic farm school uh, and I studied organic agriculture and I came back and started gardening, connecting with neighbors. Um, a lot of those bank taken properties, um, commu people who work will end up stealing the lead out of abandoned houses that were taken by the banks and sometimes they would burn it down. So we'd have all these like pockets in our community where homes used to be. And taking that land and turning it into gardens was a really powerful uh, gesture to me. Um, something that was like, I, I really enjoyed it. It was a good thing to do at the time. And I still have this garden in my community here. I also studied beekeeping and learned, uh, I met Luke in, both and I were doing a civil disobedience, trying to shut down um, city council and stop them from giving away the city to the bankruptcy law firm. So we met there, um, we remained friends and, uh, he taught me how to be a beekeeper and now we have a beekeeping co-op um, and I have 15 gallons of honey I need to put into jars later today. Um, so yeah, that's been a really fun enterprise and activity to participate in beekeeping in the city. The last thing the, the, the Rise Up did was uh, end Columbus Day, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we had worked with the city of Detroit to pass a resolution to make it Indigenous Peoples Day um, and also renaming the city Wawiatanong on Indigenous Peoples Day. So like a lot of the city stuff refers to the actual indigenous name of the city, which a lot of people just didn't know about. And in the United States, they don't teach indigenous history very much, which is crazy. You know, in the United States, we learn about the history of uh, people 10,000 years ago in Sumeria, but we don't learn about the people who were here 500 years ago um, in this land here. So that's something that we're trying to do heavily is educate people on this. and. These are the native people of Michigan uh, and building relationships with them as, you know, I'm not Anishinaabe, I'm, my indigenous ancestry is in uh, Southern Texas and Puerto Rico. Um, but building with uh, Anishinaabe people has been a really powerful way for me to, to connect in ecologically with the, the place that I'm at and the struggles that exist on this land, whether for water, for housing, for against pipelines. Uh, and I definitely try and follow their lead uh, when I can. And yeah, this is the uh, the name of Detroit, the Anishinaabe name of Detroit, which is Wawiatanong, um, which refers to the place it's located on the river. There's like a bend in the Detroit River, right where Detroit's located. Um, I was been fortunate enough every year to participate with native communities in harvesting wild rice. Um, and this is an ancient technique and it goes back to their creation story uh, which, which said like, there's something, the Anishinaabe people come from the Atlantic coast. They migrated over to the Great Lakes and their creation story said, uh, follow the Migas shell uh, to a place where food grows on water. And that food is uh, wild rice. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to participate in that activity every year for the last five years. And I'll be doing that again this fall. Um, I'm part of a, a group, that's what this tattoo is for, called the McCuckers. And um, really I was, I've been kind of informally adopted by this uh, Anishinaabe family and they've brought me into a lot of the activities they do. Uh, one of which is building birch bark canoes. Uh, so you could peel a birch tree and create a really, really amazing canoe that's very extremely lightweight. The thing weighs like 30 pounds, but it can hold a ton of weight. It's very strong, it's easily repairable. Um, and it's a, you know, a superior technology to a lot of even canoes that we have today. Um, and Anishinaabe people use these to uh, control trade in the Great Lakes. Um, and just getting to know native people through ceremony, you know, understanding the beaver, the relationship of them to the beaver. The beaver is a really powerful uh, symbol of the creation of wetlands. Um, and water has just been a, a really central part of the organizing and the activism that I've been doing since we tried to stop the water shutoffs. And this is what this photo is here. There's a water shutoff that was trying to happen in my neighborhood. And we organized with a bunch of young people to uh, stop it from happening uh, until the police end up coming to make sure it did happen. But even if the water was shut off, we would just steal it and turn the water back on with this. Uh, you can, there's a little tool here on the right where we just turn people's water back on after it was shut off to make sure people had access to water. Um, and that's, you know, a, an example of what local resistance looks like and ingenuity. 
But water it plays a really central role in ecology and protecting ecosystems. And this uh, chart here shows the lack of wetlands, the, the removal of wetlands that have happened in a lot of these urban areas. And, you know, I gave a chance to talk about this sort of thing with young people. And uh, we gave a chance to go out into wetlands and canoe and paddle wetlands and also do some citizen science on wetlands. We we're testing for um, stoneflies and other uh, large species that are indicators of water quality and water health. Um, a big part of the colonial history has been clear cutting forests and uh, the forests have been totally devastated through colonialism. Um, and that's throughout the entire eastern part of the United States. Here's a map of the destruction of forests um, that's happened uh, from the time of you know, early colonial period to now. Um, and we take our students out to old growth forests and we plant trees with students. Uh, this is a project we were planting trees with the tribal community in Saginaw, um, but that's super, super important work and it's something we continue to do and support. And I've taken that into my work with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, but environmental racism is a big issue in our communities. Uh, this is like a, a racial dot map. It looks a lot like that one we saw earlier with the green and the blue. Uh, and this is a map that shows where there's a lot of uh, toxic facilities. Uh, and if you overlay those two maps, uh, right here, you can see there's a high correlation between the African American communities and the hazardous waste facilities and pollution that exists uh, in Metro Detroit. Uh, and that's what you call environmental racism right there, uh, situating uh, pollutants in and around uh, poor black and brown communities. Uh, and the Flint water crisis was another example of this. They're cut off from Detroit's water um, and poisoned in mass. Uh, and I have done a lot of activism around that. Um, and um, organizing people in mass to stand up for water, to stand up for uh, community is something I've also been able to participate in. Uh, we brought out like 3000 people uh, last year during the democratic national debates in Detroit to uplift the idea of the Green New Deal as a solution that's like really important to helping cities like Detroit with our infrastructure and jobs and a lot of things that we're struggling with. Um, but really ultimately turning to nature has been something that's been really vital for me uh, in reconnecting and reconfiguring uh, my relationship with making change in this world. Um, and this is a group called Black to the Land that helped co-found uh, where we take people outdoors, a lot of single mothers and families and connect them with nature and spend a lot of time camping, hiking, fishing, uh, and doing those sorts of outdoor activities. And two years ago, I was hired at the National Wildlife Federation to run a program, it's an after school program. I connect kids with nature. Um, and one of the things we've done with that program is build relationships between young people and native people. Um, this is a native rapper that the students had a chance to meet. We drove up to an indigenous farm in Northern Michigan and the students learned about the mandamin or uh, maize or corn process, um, making corn, growing corn. Here the, the students are learning how to braid corn, which is how native people would dry it and, and preserve it. Um, well, we started this really amazing project in Detroit. That's the last thing I'll tell you guys about uh, before I kind of switch it over to questions and things like that is uh, this is the sugar bush project. Um, and this is like a very traditional thing to do in springtime for Native American people uh, where they tap uh, maple trees and um, make maple sugar and maple syrup. It was, a, it was a powerful way for them to get sugar and calories at the end of the winter season. Um, and this is something that we've been doing in Detroit uh, with Native people, and uh, it started off by asking permission. We went to a lot of Native American grandmothers and elders in the, in the local community, and we asked permission to tap trees, and we um, promised to share the abundance of those trees with Indigenous communities. Uh, and then we brought in uh, Native sugar makers from Indigenous uh, reservations to the city of Detroit where they could teach us how to do the sugar bush. And, and provide us some ceremony and song and culture around uh, facilitating a sugar bush. Uh, and then that was it. We started tapping maple trees, boiling maple syrup uh, and producing maple sugar. Um, and ultimately uh, the process has been incredibly beautiful and rewarding uh, to bring this sort of like ancient indigenous technologies to urban communities. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, communities like Detroit, where we saw how it's the front line for environmental racism. We had a disproportionate amount of people die from COVID-19 in the city of Detroit. Um, 
you know, water shutoffs, housing stuff. In many ways, Detroit is in the United States a frontline community in, in the struggle for climate change and the struggle for justice. Um, and a lot of these communities are super preoccupied with surviving and getting by on the day to day. Um, so, so fighting for the environment, fighting for nature is often removed from people's lives and people's distance from nature is often pretty vast. So uh, Black to the Land and what I do with the National Wildlife Federation are here to help bridge that gap and to plug kids and young people in black and brown communities in with nature uh, so that we can uh, advocate and make a difference. Um, if you can get people to fall in love with nature, my working theory is that you can get them to mobilize, to protect it and organize around it. Uh, and these are students in my program speaking out and demanding um, more renewable energy from uh, DTE, which is a monopoly energy company uh, in Michigan. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, some of the themes like localizing food is another really powerful thing. Something like 3% of food is eaten uh, in Detroit that's grown in Detroit and we wanna get that number up. Uh, we, got, we, we built a bunch of garden beds for students in my program this year since they were all at home during the pandemic. Um, I think indigenous relationships is really, are really important to me. Um, this idea of land back is an idea that indigenous tra tribal community has been pushing for. Uh, this idea that 22% um, of all land in the world is controlled by native people and that land is uh, where 80% of the biodiversity of the world is located. So obviously tr indigenous communities are doing something right in what they're doing to protect land and how they organize around land. And we definitely as a society should be supporting that. Um, and I think reparations and, and reversing environmental racism are absolutely necessary components to engaging in you know, a just transition away from this energy intensive war, fossil fuel economy that this United States empire has been developing over the last, uh, you know, I mean, really, we've been a, a, su a global superpower since the 1940s and 50s. Um, but yeah, uh, renewable energy is obviously a part of it, but all of the things we've been discussing here so far are also a part of the game too. Um, building with indigenous communities, connecting black and indigenous communities, growing your own food, connecting in with nature, mobilizing people around important issues that are not just the environment. You know, people have housing, uh, there's a lot of costs that people have in frontline communities that are also necessary and part components of environmental justice struggles. Uh, and yeah, and that's it. Feel free to hit me up on Instagram. There's my email. Uh, you can check out these hashtags and look up more of our work. Uh, and I'm open to talking and, and engaging and, and taking questions or whatever you guys would like to do for the rest of the time. That is great. Uh, thanks so much. Great uh, perspective that we don't hear very often. If I can ask a question, you started mm -hmm. out uh, in college to be a pharmacist. That sounds like kind of a conventional society uh, trajectory that you had in mind for yourself. Of course, yeah. it changed dramatically since then. Yeah. Lots of indigenous and back to nature and uh, caring about people. Um, now that you've had some experience with that, are you convinced that's the right route? Is that going to succeed? Is that is that what we more of us should do? I mean, how do you feel? about that perspective now that you've had some Well, experience. I'm happy I'm not a pharmacist, that's for sure. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> well, I, I started selling weed when I was 15 and I've, I've always kind of had some relationship with the marijuana market. So it seemed like a logical next step is to move up to selling legitimate drugs. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, I don't know why I wanted to do it for, to make money, you know, I, I grew up in a working class family. My dad was an iron worker. Uh, and like, he always kind of drilled home the point of going to college and getting a job that will make you money. And then you can have an impact on the world. Uh, and he was very frustrated for years that I didn't go and get a corporate job right out of college. Um, uh, you know, I do I know that everybody should take this path? You know, I, I don't, I don't I'm not, I would never say that. Uh, I think everybody has their own path and everybody has their own role to play. I think we do need activists, even though I consider myself a retired activist. I don't engage in activism that much these days. I'm mostly doing outdoor nature related work. Um, so I think like, I also like reject the idea people should do one thing their entire lives. Obviously I've done like a million things and I continue to like 
diversify the things that I'm involved with and connected with. And I think it's all together made me a more well-rounded person um, and given me experiences uh, and ideas and values and relationships that inform the way I think and approach my organizing, my education uh, and the advocacy that I do. Um, so yeah, I don't like regret anything. You know, I, I'm very pleased with the direction I'm, I've been going in. Uh, and I wouldn't say it's for everybody, but I would say that um, the work that I do, I, I try and think and speak to the deeper core challenges and contradictions and uh, parts of society that the United States doesn't deal with. You know, like we're having arguments over critical race theory um, when uh, Native American people just got the right to vote like 40 years ago. Uh, the last boarding school in the United States where Native American people were forced into assimilation, raped and abused, closed in the 1970s. Uh, eugenics laws were on the books in Puerto Rico up into the 1970s. Uh, so this like racialized capitalism that we all exist in is something that's very new in recent history. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's really important to, to think deeply. And I, and I hope that the work that I do and the education that I can do can get people to think deeply. Great answers, really appreciate that. I see Henrietta has an interesting question or comment. Henrietta, would you like to ask that? Sure. I mean, you've you've done so much. I find your life fascinating. So my question is, based on all the things that you've done, what would you say to the person that's just starting out, the rest of the young people here, what are your top two lessons learned that you would yeah. want to make sure you pass along? Thanks. The people who are starting out and engaging in like environmental or sustainability work. Yeah. Um, I think like the work you do has got to be rooted, rooted in the needs of your community for it to be relevant. Um, so I think like going and thinking deeply about the challenges your community faces is like a really important place to start. Um, because I think a lot, a lot of times it's backwards within the nonprofit foundational academic structure where uh, like the, the, the solutions are top down and proposed by other people. It's like you write a grant, you have an idea, you write a grant, you, get, you go to the community, you try and build up support for that idea, which may or may not get funded. Uh, and then that's like the process. It's kind of backwards, you know? Um, and I think similarly, uh, you know, I don't know what it's like in the places you grew up in. I don't think colonialism is the ruling character of uh, all parts of the world. You know, there are places where, you know, haven't been colonized. So like, you know, I don't know the relationships and the stories of to where you come from, uh, but here, um, going that deep has been a very important necessary component, but I think every country has its own racialization, you know, and its own like ethno-nationalism that's, that's happening right now. Uh, in India, it's like Hindu versus Muslim, and there's like regional ethnic differences. Um, in, in all parts of the world, every nation, there's like a different thing. There's a different racialization. Uh, and I think like it, it really helps to look at what's happening to people in the margins uh, and thinking about like what's happening in those places and solutions that can fit those places are often things that can be applicable more broadly. In the same way that devastating, horrible, experimental stuff happens in poor black and brown communities, the solutions that we need more broadly, you'll find in those same places too. Um, so I hope that people dig deep uh, and look for solutions that are re re relative to the racial class uh, structures and hierarchies in the history of the places that we live. Thank you. If I may just follow up, a lot of the folks that are my colleagues are, are, are young and just starting, as I discussed before, and I'm wondering if you believe that they should have a seat at the table right out of school. Yeah, I mean, I, I think before leaving school, like I think young people should be thinking about and you should be learning mathematics based on the problems that our society has. Education systems are really outdated in the United States, really outdated. Um, and, you know, edu our education systems are, are failing rapidly and particularly this like computer era, Bill Gates fantasy land of everybody on their computers and nobody learning in a social emotional way. Uh, these are really, really significant problems that we have. Uh, but 
social emotional learning that's relevant to the people the experiences that people have why is it that i grew up in one of the most segregated communities in the united states and i didn't learn about it until i graduated from college i had to leave college to pick up origins of the urban crisis if you live in the united states i'd highly recommend and you live in a metro area that's also segregated i highly recommend picking up this book by thomas sabru origins of the urban crisis um, but why is it that i had to leave college to pick up a book that helped me understand the racialized, segregated place that I grew up in. That helped me understand, like, why is my parents lost their home? Why is it the kids in the suburbs where I was going to school have, you know, million dollar homes? Why is it that like that? You know, why is it that my parents have to take out a mortgage and lose their home to pay for my education? Because I live in a poor area. Um, and that's just, uh, you don't learn that in school. And it should. I mean, school should be oriented towards problem, sol solving the problems of society. But I think there's a quote that I, I've learned that's really important is like, um, no oppressive institution is gonna give you the knowledge that it takes to overthrow it, which is why uh, critical knowledge, critical race theory, um, you know, intersectional stuff is being taken out and, and attacked so much by uh, the media and the, the right wing. Great answer. Henrietta, any more comments? Somebody else, Ad Adele, posted, I worked with little kids in urban areas who don't have a lot of experience with outdoors and hesitant to outside. outside. If you're out, if I find your outdoor movements very inspiring, do you have any strategies for getting kids excited about outdoors and tap into their ingrained strengths and confidence? The younger, the better. I think like every person, human being is born with an innate curiosity that I think uh, is beaten out of them by like reality and like uh, poor explanations and not enough you know, like every kid, you, you grow up, they'll pass a homeless person. They're like, what's going on with that person, mommy or daddy? And like what, the, you know, parents, like you, you're busy. You want to give them a quick response to like what's happening. But I think asking questions is one of the most important things that anybody can ever do in society. And maintaining that curiosity and growing that curiosity, I think, is a central central feature in, in keeping young people engaged. And um, so the younger, the better, I would say. Uh, there's this program that we developed with Black Design called Forest School, and it's like one day a week, student, all these like young kids go out into the forest and just like hang out and learn and study. And that's a really important thing. Like you have to get that relationship in young. Uh, otherwise, people develop like a, a fear of nature, a fear of water, a fear of forests. Uh, and poor black and brown communities, overgrown lots are tend to be associated with danger uh, and harm. So like forests looking like overgrown, untended places uh, do look dangerous. Um, and I mean, there's so much, there's so much to say about this, but uh, um, I think it's important that <clears throat> getting into nature happens among people of color and it's led by people of color too, because you want to see people like you in order to be motivated and know that that's something for you. You know, I've taken kids uh, cross country skiing and you're not going to talk to a black person in Detroit, like, oh, that's something we should be doing as black people's cross country skiing. Um, and a lot of kids think that this is a white people thing to do. So it's we really try hard to uh, work with local leadership and uh, have uh, people who can look like the students to inspire them and show them that this is something that you have every right to do, too. Uh, and you, you belong here and we all belong here and we all have, you know, a deep, innate love for nature and that it brings about a sense of peace and joy and comfort and happiness that you're going to have a tough time finding in uh, cities. Um, so I think like making it something fun, sexy, exciting, getting uh, people that they might admire to participate in it, showing them people on social media who are doing it well, people of color who are doing it well, uh, those are all good tactics to engage with people and connect them with nature. Great answer, and I see Noah. You you have an interesting question about climate change in Detroit. You want to want to share that? Yeah, sure. And thanks for the great presentation, um, Antonio. It's been awesome. Um, but I just had a question. So you mentioned Detroit is one of the frontline communities facing climate change. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, what are some of the metrics that you think show what areas will be most vulnerable to climate change? Like, is it yeah, primarily? Yeah. So, so there's. Um, we've been devastated by the emerald ash borer and the Dutch elm disease. So we lost a lot of our canopy, our tree cover. Um, and there's a, the, um, 
I want to say it's U.S. Forests is a group that's been pu publishing a lot of data showing the uh, wealth inequality in the way that plays out with canopy coverage. So like uh, as we get heat events and we have the, my house is built in 1926, it's not oriented, you know, thinking about the direction of in the sun coming up and down and all these things. So like, um, yeah, I think like a, a solution would be like helping get people's houses ready for, you know, extra cold winters, extra hot summers, drought, uh, water, lots of waterfall. I mean, Maya Power has been out a number of times in the last two weeks. Detroit had a major, major flood uh, uh, about like a month ago. Um, and that's impacted our infrastructure. Um, you know, that makes more waste, people's houses and basements flooding. Um, so there's so many ways. I mean, name, name, name one, you know, we get droughts, we get a lot of dangerous things. Like um, there's a new thing that's been popping up these uh, super humid, hot days. If the humidity is above a certain percentage, your body cannot naturally cool itself by sweating. Uh, in a place where there's no tree canopy cover uh, and there's a little shade, people have a high chance of dying of heat stroke and overheating because of the bodies can't cool. It's like a new phenomena. It's a part of climate change. There's a lot of good data and in, in articles. In fact, if you search my name on Google, there's one that my friend published about the heat and the water. Um, Great comment. I'm looking at the chat. Elaine, uh, you raised an interesting question and Sebastian had a comment. Elaine, do you wanna share that with us? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my question was when thinking about climate change, there's a lot of like that it has to be quick and it's a problem that needs to be solved as soon as possible. Um, but like you're saying, it's important to make sure that the strategies and solutions we're using aren't reinforcing the broken systems that currently exist and they are supporting disinvested communities. Um, so I've heard, I actually heard this from the diversity, equity and inclusion director of Cook County. And she told me that in her opinion, slowing down is actually really important to make sure that um, historically unincluded voices are included in solutions. And I just wondered if that, what you thought about that, if yeah. slowing down is necessary. I, I do, I do think I do like, I mean, it's such an open, vague statement, you know, like it could be applied to so many situations in different ways. I'll say this though, I'll think of specifically about like um, in Detroit, uh, we had a big problem with too many houses. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, financial crisis comes through, takes people's homes, um, people scrap them, burn them, abandoned, destroyed structures all over the city. So the fast approach that the uh, white suburban mayor, new mayor of Detroit, the takeover mayor, the post bankruptcy mayor uh, of Detroit took was let's get rid of as many homes as possible, as quick as possible. Um, rather than taking a route of like training up to droiders to learn about deconstructing homes in really safe ways where there's not a, lead, a lot of lead poisoning, they chose to use some of the wealthiest demolition companies in the state, monopoly companies, and they brought them in with no bid contracts into the city to just straight up demolish homes with equipment very fast and very rapidly. Obviously homes that are built in the 1920s are full of lead and there's been a lead poisoning crisis that's been followed that. So that's an example of like, you can do something by slowing down and doing it intentionally and looking at the needs of the community. There's a ton of unemployed people in Detroit, a ton of unemployed people in Detroit. Whereas like the unemployment level is like, I wanna say like, 5%, they say nationally, but so much higher, really. Um, but it's like something like 40 or 50% in a city like Detroit. There's so many unemployed people that are just looking for work, that want something to do. So training these people in something about like deconstruction would have been a, a slower way to go. It would have been more expensive, probably would have been like safer people's, you know, for the environment and probably could have salvaged a lot of waste. Um, and I think similarly, I think we, we think about climate solutions. I think the, the, the urgency is to build, 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 new, 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 destroy the old. And like retrofitting homes is going to be one of the major things that needs to be done. I mean, there's, there's, there's an unlimited amount of work that needs to be done. And the United States government opens up the floodgates of capital for financial crises to bail out banks and bail out financial institutions. You know, like we should be doing that sort of like deficit spending and, uh, creative uh, economics to support um, all of the work that needs to be done, all of the crumbling infrastructure. There's so many things. I think the Green New Deal is a really great policy that's oriented towards this 
So yes, slowing down, but also like, yes, speeding up in other areas. Um, I mean, we should radically slow down the, the energy, the, the, the war machine. I mean, the United States, the number one user of oil is the US military with our bases all over the world. A lot of those bases are on low lying areas right on the water. A lot of those bases will be potentially underwater in the very near future. Um, so the US military is unsustainable as fuck. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's a mixed bag. I think it's an interesting, I, I personally like the idea of slowing down. I've loved the, the, the slowing down it's interpersonally, individually had in my life during the coronavirus crisis is I've had an opportunity to spend more time with my family, spend more time on my land, look at the problems I have in my own home, uh, as opposed to being go, 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 organize, do, act. Um, so there's a lot of ways to take that. Great answer. And let me cut to another question that actually comes from Adele, but let me ask it, uh, if you don't mind, Adele. Uh, you, you're working on Detroit trying to achieve a vision could you share what that vision would be? That is, let's say it was a perfect Detroit. Everything that you're aiming for was accomplished. And of course, uh, it's a bit of a hypothetical question, but uh, what would that vision be? And will Detroit ever get there? Is it on the track to get there or is it well, I, not on the track? I, I think the, um, the problem with that question is it's an individualized analysis about like how one place could be the place that it could ideally be. And that's impossible. Uh, and it's the same problem with that happened with the bankruptcy process. You know, they, they wanted to take a look at Detroit's finances and they individualized Detroit to look at whether Detroit's a, sol sol a solvent city. Uh, when in fact, Detroit is a metropolitan area of 5 million people that includes some of the wealthiest communities in the United States. There's a community in the southern part of Bloomfield Hills where the average income is $386,000 a year. The average income of the entire city of Detroit is $26,000 a year. So if I was to wave a magic wand and build a future, uh, it wouldn't be a future for just Detroit. It'd have to be a, a global future. It'd have to be a, a future for the United States. It'd have to be a future that includes the rural communities. I mean, the divide between city and urban is like this weird, can I swear, fuckery of like identity politics and nonsense. Like the same, like at the same Rural communities have been suffering under the concentration of agricultural into fewer hands, fewer companies since the last like 70, 80 years. The same time Detroit has been in decline too. So like right now we have like Trump in the rural areas, you know, whatever liberal candidate Bernie at best uh, in the cities. And like we're fighting each other in the streets over uh, Elmo or uh, abortion or whatever, you know, not thinking about class. Um, so all that is to say is, if I was to wave a magic wand, it's gonna have to include a vision much bigger than Detroit. It's gonna have to say the United States stops. I mean, and this is deep because the, uh, the Pentagon has a person who's focused on industrial uh, large scale agriculture. The Pentagon has an interest in food security. Uh, and that's a scary thing, honestly. Uh, given the history of the United States all over the world. I actually met the Pentagon guy. I was speaking at a conference for a uh, CRISPR con. CRISPR -Con. Um, and I, I, I like was staying with a friend. I ended up after conference hanging out too long. And I ended up like spending the night in the hotel room of the guy who works at the Pentagon uh, on large scale agriculture. And they're all balls deep into genetic genetically modified futures into monopolized seed company futures. And that's the opposite direction the world needs to go. India, like the farmers in India have it super on point with protecting their seeds and fighting these multinational corporations. Um, so if I was to wave a magic wand, it would have to include reducing large scale industrial agriculture, which poisons our water, gets rid of our soil, poisons our land. We waste a ton of energy on biofuels. I'd eliminate the biofuels nonsense. I would certainly eliminate biomass. Uh, that's not a green solution, okay? Chopping down trees and burning them is not a green solution. Uh, that's really dumb. It's big, been a popular thing the last like 15, 20 years. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn on nuclear. Um, you know, like I think fusion has some prospects. The United States stopped investing in fusion and we took up uh, shale, shale gas fracking as like an intermediate oil, but it's one of the dumbest things in terms of the way it impacts nature and water um, but that's like the name of the game within this neoliberal sort of world government we live in, um, where 
privatized water is the best possible thing for companies. So like poisoning people's water to produce short-term energy seems like a solution somehow. So getting away from all that. Um, and I think, um, yeah, like putting people to work, preparing for the climate future that we have coming, figuring out a new construction style because like this like drywall housing, like obviously like we see how sensitive these systems are towards uh, the globalized markets. I mean, there's been a lumber shortage that's been happening across the world for the, like the last, you know, it, it's, it's four or five times the cost on lumber to, to do houses. And we have a dumb way to build homes in the United States. Um, so we have to switch up. I mean, we're running out of sand in the world to build homes. China put more concrete in in 2019 than like the United States has in its history. Uh, there's sand cartels all over the world stealing sand from rivers and shit like that. Like that's unsustainable, can't do that. So we have to think about like some of these like bigger picture things and the wand has, the magic wand has to be a global thing because Detroit alone won't save us. That's for sure. Another great answer. Can I switch to indigenous people? Yeah. A lot of working with them and very impressive what, what you and your colleagues are doing. Uh, but you mentioned urban indigenous and I'm wondering how big a population, what fraction of the indigenous are urban and what are some of the differences or challenges that the urban indigenous face compared to the folks who live, let's say, in more rural areas? Oh, God, that's such a good question. Um, so actually, there's more of a native population in Detroit, in the metro Detroit area, than there is in all the reservations combined in Michigan. Um, so one of the challenges is uh, maintaining your culture, identity, relationship to history, ancestry for native people in cities. There's a lot of, there's like the perennial problem with the native communities is probably more info than you guys need, but like who's actually native is like always people are fighting each other over this conversation. It's just like these weird identity things is like a big thing. And I'm not like, I, I'm, I'm fine organizing around identity. I organize events like this weekend, we'll be doing a, an event that's only people of color. Uh, that's like a, a canoe a kayaking day. And I, I'm fine organizing around identity, but I also think like when you're a fundamentalist about it, it's, um, and too too negative and destructive it's such an easy place for people to like just type away from their screens and yell at each other all day so that's a big problem uh lateral violence i mean more broadly all native communities across the entire place as i mentioned um uh boarding schools is a big problem because the people who went there were kids who were forced and taken away from their families oftentimes sexually abused and raped and kids who get raped at a young age tend to rape and abuse other people. So there's a lot of like intergenerational trauma and pain that exists in just the one, like the, the, the grandparents of this generation. And for those people, it was actually illegal until the 1970s perform their own ceremonies. The United States made it illegal for native people to perform their own ceremonies up into the 1970s. So recovering a lot of the history and ancestry, that's a big problem and challenge. Um, traditional ecological knowledge is like, you know, like when an elder dies, the library dies. Like uh, one of the women I showed in this photo, there's two women, Mary Moose and Daisy Costas. And those two Anishinaabe grandmothers have so much knowledge because they grew up in a more traditional way. And preserving that knowledge is another major thing. Language loss is another major thing. I think uh, there are like something like 6,000 languages in the world. I mean, it's like 3,000. I get numbers confused. I'm dyslexic, but um, half of those will be gone by 2050. Half of the indigenous languages around the world are going to be gone by 2050. And do you know what a language is, what it represents? Indigeneity to me is a people group that it has a relationship, its language, its philosophy, its worldview is informed by a particular ecosystem. That's to me like what in, uh, defines indigeneity. And when you lose the people who have the traditional ecological knowledge, the language, the philosophy of that ecosystem, we lose so, so, so much. Uh, that's why it's such a travesty what's happening in the Amazon and how it's fucked up that the United States supported Bolsonaro's fascist, uh, you know, I have nothing but negative words to say about him uh, and what's happening in the Amazon. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of a highlight of some of the challenges native people face uh, on top of the other existing challenges that exist. Um, for all people of color and people in urban communities. Another weird, unique phenomenon about native people in the Great Lakes is they're just really light skinned uh, and they all kind of fight each other over who's actually native. I mentioned that earlier, but it's kind of weird. Not a thing that happens everywhere, but it happens here big time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of challenges. So Ashley just put a comment in uh, having to do with uh, 
indigenous and underprivileged communities. Ashley, would you like to ask that or share that? Sure. So I just went, uh, wondered what um, you've seen happening in like the indigenous and under underprivileged communities that you've been working with, how they've grown in like comfort and are more motivated possibly to be part of the conversations to promote their nature preser preservation and act out against state push to take away natural resources. Like now that they've talked to you and know that they have a way to actually act out against that, you know, yeah. a lot of people aren't comfortable. How, how have you seen that grow? Yeah. Um, so I, I, native and underprivileged communities have like different orientations and relationships with nature. And so like urban native people have the same struggles, histories, problems, challenges as other urbanized people. Reservation Native American people have a whole different unique set of problems. Um, encroachment on treaty rights, access to traditional hunting grounds, um, conservation of lands. And I have seen growing movements of indigenous people farming, hunting. There's a really, really strong movement in the United States of indigenous cooking and food cultures. And there's not enough of a, of a strength with indigenous agriculture just yet. There are some really exa great examples of indigenous agriculture. One I would cite is Oneida uh, in, in Wisconsin. They're a community that's on the border of, of uh, Green Bay uh, and they own a ton of land and they do a lot of really wonderful agriculture there. Uh, and they also do a lot of hunting up there. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, all that's under threat. Like I have a buddy named uh, Biscockany, Greg Johnson. Um, I'd follow him on Instagram. Um, put his name here. That's his Instagram name, but um, he's amazing. Um, he like actually has like, been hunting and fishing for a long time. The tribe he comes from is called Lac du Flambeau, which was named after the night spear fishing tribal communities did with torches and spears. Uh, and he continues to do the spear fishing. And he actually was shot at by a settler not too long ago uh, up there, up north. And um, so, yeah, that's the kind of things that tribal people face. You have tribal communities up in uh, the Georgia Bay who are like, you know, getting their fishing boats burned and all that crazy shit. So that's a very different thing that native people in the city are facing. Um, but when it comes to native people in the city, I, don't, I think like finding the local nature and protecting that and organizing around that's been really powerful. Uh, I think a lot of people have been deeply touched and moved by the work we're doing with the sugar bush, um, tasting that maple sugar that's from the city, actually from where our sugar bush is located right in the city of Detroit, um, has been really powerful. Um, but yeah, I think it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual renewing thing to spend a lot of time in nature to reconnect. Uh, and I have seen probably a handful of people, like maybe like 20 who have like been people who are like afraid of nature, moved to loving it, to move to participating and protecting it, you know, and, and, and engaging with environmental justice movements. And to me, that's like the pipeline that I, I want to be building, building up as much as I can, you know, as critical thinkers and people who are, are falling in love and protecting something that's uh, so precious. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah, great answer. We're getting, we're, we have one minute left actually. Mm. Maybe there's time for one more question. I'm looking at the chat here. Um, oh, uh, Ustabi, Ustabi, would you like to share your comment? Yeah, hey, um, I just wanted to ask if there is anything major or um, revolutionary that has been done for these marginalized communities that has actually made a difference and has not faced a lot of opposition from the government or like the white communities? Mm. Ooh, that's a tough question. I, I think like we've had some success in fighting some pipelines. That's been good. I mean, the sugar bush, we've, I mean, the pipeline stuff has faced a lot of fight back. But no, I mean, no revolutionary thing is going to be like easy. That's for sure. Um, I mean, like, I wouldn't call uh, changing the indigenous, making the indigenous peoples there a revolutionary thing. That didn't get any fight back. You know, that was like really easily done. Just had to talk to city council, you know, you know, talk to rally the native community, pass the resolution, and we do our celebrations. Those are like small, easy things. You know, I think like historic figures would say, like, um, I think America Cabral would say, don't celebrate easy victories. Um, but we do celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day anyways, even though it was an easy victory. Um, but uh, no, I think like any sort of revolutionary idea is gonna face uh, trouble. It's gonna be hard. Um, so yeah, I would say 
there's been a lot of little tiny things that are individually revolutionary for people, you know, changes. Um, but I would say no. I mean, uh, Detroit is largely in control by like a takeover government. It's like that all the movement stuff we were doing was losses. Um, what stopped the water shutoffs was COVID. COVID-19 stopped the water shutoffs. They kept the water shutoffs from 2013 to 2000 and uh, what is it like 19, 20 when the COVID-19 happened. Um, and I, I think like decolonial is revolutionary and decolonial is watered down to like decolonial cooking or decolonial embroidery or whatever. Like, but decolonial literally means like taking the land back. Uh, so uh, actively ceding sovereignty uh, to indigenous peoples and getting more land in their hands is like a decolonial act. And that's revolutionary. Um, and I, I, I don't know that revolution will ever come in the United States, honestly. Uh, I, I often find like globally, it happens on the periphery. I think the, 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 the decline of the US empire is actually probably one of the things we should look forward to the most. Um, you know, uh, because you know, not that I think like China is like a better global hegemon, but I think we are moving into a multipolar world where um, regional powers have more say in autonomy. I think the United States pulling out of Afghanistan is an example of that. Um, and is that revolutionary for the Taliban? I don't know. You know, like wh who defines revolutionary? Um, yeah. So I don't know. The world's in a crazy way right now because the NATO, UK, Israel sort of like Gulf state. Uh, so I'm talking into geopolitics, which is another big major hobby of mine. I love geopolitics. I could talk about geopolitics all day long. But I would say the United States is kind of a continuation of uh, the Nazis. Honestly, straight up. I mean, the Nazis studied United States Manifest Destiny. That's what he uh, based Lebensraum off of. Uh, he studied with eugenicists from the United States. After World War II was uh, lost, the United States was bringing all the Nazis over to be scientists, to go into NSA, to go into like the ISS, which is the pre-runner of the CIA, um, stashing them in Latin America. They joined NASA. Um, and that sort of like white ethno-nationalism is what Trump was riding in on. And we, that's clearly still a dominant phenomenon. Eugenics is still a logic within the American psyche. Ask any American if they think population is the problem in the world. A, company, a country whose people consume more than anything else in the world, produce more waste, can do, consume more resources, wants to think like the people in Nigeria who are producing like what, 3.8% of global emissions in, in, in all of Africa? In all of Africa? And we think the population of Nigeria is the problem? That's eugenics. That's a logic that's deep in the American psyche. Um, so like they're, the revolution, if I have to say, uh, Utsav, Utsavi, is gonna to have to be in like the mentality and the brains and the minds of people. Um, because that's like the place that we have to start with always. It's always like in here. It's always, for me, it was like trauma and pain of my family losing their home, but everybody's gotta get shaken up somehow. Some event has to like motivate people to see that like, oh, you know what this ticky tacky American dream thing that we've all been working towards is kind of fucked up. It's kind of like not working out so good actually. And that's what it's gonna take all over the world in different places at different times. You know, people are gonna have to see the ethno-nationalism of Modi is not working out. People are gonna, it's, it's the, that's, that's what's gotta happen all over the world. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm deeply anti-imperial, if, if anything, um, because the United States is the empire of oil. We are truly cutting off Germany from that oil in, in, in the Caspian Sea was a major strategy in winning World War II. And we've been running with that shit ever since. And that's why the United States military is the number one oil user and producer or a number one oil user. And that's why it, with Syria, we occupy the oil provinces. Uh, but the United States with its domestic energy is less and less reliant on the Middle East. That's why we're pulling out of there. Guess who is relying on the Middle East energy and oil? China, China. Those straits are where the wars will happen. The periphery of Russia and China is where the future wars will take place. That's where World War III is gonna start. Um, and I think it is incumbent upon everybody to be thinking about peace and war and energy and oil as you're thinking about beautiful solutions for communities, as you're thinking about green energy, uh, because if that's the future that we're headed towards, which seems, you know, like there's a book that's put out recently about this called um, The Thucydides Trap, um, chance of the, high, the chance of the United, of 
a, a major hegemon going to war when another major hegemon takes over. I mean, when the United States took over for, for uh, England, that was World War II, World War I. You know, so I think we're, we're headed in for crazy, interesting times in the next 50 or 60 years. Uh, and I would just say, like, think, think deeply. And um, yeah, just like, look who's funding the solutions <laughs> that you're developing. Uh, Cargill, you know, Monsanto, uh, Dow. Uh, these institutions are, are not going to be the ones that are going to be producing what's, what's needed for the earth and what's, what's good. You know, so I think... Um, yeah, we got to dig deep. So Antonio, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the time and we really do have to run out of here. But uh, thanks for the back and forth. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being so honest. Uh, and I you know we're look forward to connecting with you at some time in the future. Yeah, me too. Everybody feel free to reach out. I have my contact information up there.